Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah everyone and welcome to Bayt al-Maqdis step-by-step training. Uh, my name is Amir. I'm from Palestine and currently live in the UK. I'm the vice president of the Association of Student Activism for Palestine. Uh, we are one of the organizations that are helping in uh, or collaborating in uh, organizing this training. Uh, Welcome again for this lecture, Bayt al Maqdis. And this is uh, the second training this year. Uh, and we, we're very happy that everyone is uh, well, uh, happy about this training. So uh, before we start, uh, just want to make sure some of the uh, points that we, we, we're going like, to uh, raise. So the first thing is we will be taking uh, the attendance uh, for, uh, for this week, inshallah. If you are interested in receiving uh, a certificate, and uh, you would like to, to to give it like to hand it at the end of the training. So please make sure to attend the lecture the lecture live. And also you need to uh, fill the attendance form every time you uh, watch this training. Uh, now, inshallah ta'ala, we welcome Dr. Khaled. But before I get him in, I will uh, just give a very short introduction about him. So Dr. Khaled Awaisi is a graduate of pioneering field of Islamic Jerusalem studies, where he received his master's and subsequent his PhD from the University of Aberdeen in 2006. His main specialty in this uh, historical geography of Bayt al-Maqdis and geographical interpretation of the Quran. Beside these uh, studies, he published tens of articles and books, chapters in the same field and the same Islamic studies. He also the editor of the Journal of Islamic Jerusalem Studies, uh, and uh, he's the uh, currently works as an associate professor and the head department of the Islamic history at Social Science University of Ankara, and teaches on the master's program in both Ankara and Merdin. So please welcome Dr. Khaled to join us online. Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank okay, you. For, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm. I'm. We're sorry about what happened uh, about the confusion that we have in the time. Uh, yes. And you see, like people that like, they thought uh, it should be started like at two GMT, but it's uh, yeah. it's different than the UK time. So. So. Yes, and I think we have people in Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia who are following and it's quite late for them and also yeah. we have people following from the united states and the other part of the world so uh i think uh maybe from next week if we move it uh one hour earlier than this yeah. time it might be much more suitable for everyone so maybe like okay, do we need to ask uh, everyone like for example like they can give on the on the YouTube, they can comment that, or, yes, yes, or we just sort it out that is will we will be using yes. the Bayt al Maqdis sign? Yes, uh, very good. Yes, to use Bayt al Maqdis sign. So for Bayt al Maqdis time from next week, if everyone accepts this, so an hour earlier than now uh, to start the program. If everyone accepts this, and if they write in the comments uh, section, then we will do that from next uh, from next week, inshallah. Okay, that's all right. Let's see if, see if anyone be, will be happy with that. Yeah, like some people, they say like one hour earlier, please. Um, yeah, this 2 p.m. Is, is better. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 So um, uh, I, I will just do the uh, the attendance form, inshallah, like in a few minutes. I will just make it pin, uh, pinned on the YouTube channel. But before we proceed that, uh, would you like Dr. Khaled to, to listen to some uh, Qur'an? Uh, before we yes. start, or we, what do you think? Yes, yes, I think it will be excellent to start this uh, program with some recitation of the Quran uh, to get the barakah uh, of it. Talking about the land of barakah to get some barakah at the start will be will be great, inshallah. Amazing, inshallah. So, so we welcome uh, Brother Omar. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Ahlan wa sahlan. You're welcome. Okay. Um, yeah. The mic is yours, mic is so yours. you can start reading. Okay, are we ready now? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay. I'm going to read 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ودع إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين وإن عاقبتم فعاقبوا بمثل ما عوقبتم به ولئن صبرتم وَلَئِنْ صَبَرْتُمْ لَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لِلصَّابِرِينَ وَاصْبِرْ وَمَا صَبْرُكَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا تَكُ فِي ضَيْقٍ إن الله مع الذين اتقوا والذين هم محسنون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خير بطاب عمر and uh, thank you for this uh, brilliant brilliant uh, actually it, 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 it's it's my it's my honor it's my uh, it's my dignity uh, to be here uh, before speech of uh, our beloved uh, Ustaz Khalid yeah. Uh, yeah. really it's my honor uh, I wish to be uh, good and uh, Inshallah, inshallah. This program for us. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You are welcome. Let's we get uh, Dr. Khaled again uh, here. Uh, just before we start, Dr. Khaled, uh, I forgot to mention about uh, organization that we have these uh, collaborated to do this training. So uh, the the first, of course, like the Academy for Islamic Jerusalem Studies, uh, the Association of Student Activism for Palestine. Uh, I love Al-Aqsa organization, Halwa from Malaysia, Palestine Information Network, South Africa, and Baytul Maqdis Waqf, Turkey. And also we're grateful to uh, Social Sciences University of Ankara for providing this course. The university is the first in the Muslim world to offer a taught master program in Islamic Jerusalem studies. Um, and now, um, I think we, now it's time to do the draw. Uh, for the past uh, attendance, right? Yes, if you, uh, the draw actually uh, last, we had a 10 week course on Beit al uh last year, and the people received the certificates. And one of the people that uh, attended will be uh, uh, going to Beit al Maqdis. So there is a draw for people who are living in Europe or uh, uh, those who qualify so uh, to to join this, there will be a draw uh, for them for one person to be able to go to Al Masjid Al Aqsa and to Beit uh, Al Maqdis. MashaAllah. Okay, so I will just share the screen so we can make the draw. So is everyone seeing it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so yes. Okay. So we've got the names here. Uh, let me just open it again. Yes. So uh, 
I will start on your sign. So just let me know when I can start so we can know the uh, the winner, inshallah. So, so this will choose the winner? Yes. By spinning the wheel? Uh, yes. You have... Okay, go ahead. Bismillah. Yeah, or maybe can we, we can do just shuffling. Okay. So we just no, shuffle spinning. the name. Okay, spinning the wheel is also a, a nice idea. Yes. Ah, yes. so you shuffle the names, you change yeah, it. I shuffle the names, and then we can uh, do the spinning. Go so ahead. We will start right now. Three, two, one, and here we go. So, mashallah, the winner is Khadija Rahman. Mashallah, mashallah. And yes, Khadija will win uh, a trip to Bayt al Maqdis to Jerusalem, Palestine, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. Okay. Um, anything else before we start, inshallah? No, we can get started, inshallah. Yalla, bismillah. Congratulations to Mr. Khadija. Okay, it's over to you, Dr. Khalid. Then. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassili amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yaqahu qawli. First of all, I'm honored to be with you here um, talking about Bayt al-Maqdis for the next six weeks. And uh, inshallah, as agreed, we will move the classes one hour earlier. And uh, over the next few weeks, inshallah, we will be discussing and I will go through the content of the topics that we will be discussing, inshallah, Azza wa But talking about Bayt al-Maqdis, especially on these days, this is the, uh, tomorrow is the anniversary of the first intifada against the first occupiers in Bayt al-Maqdis. And Bayt al-Maqdis is going through a very difficult time. And seeing people from across the world, from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Australia, from South Africa, from Pakistan, from Kashmir, uh, from uh, North Africa, all the way to uh, Europe and to the United States. And these people are all coming together. The, the, the amount of people that have applied for this course uh, uh, went beyond uh, expectation. Uh, the, 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 the people are going through the list and the, the, the ones that have sent you the emails. Uh, the last I heard was over 1,600 people have registered, but I think there were some problems with the email. Some people were, were having difficulty as it was going into their spam. However, inshallah, جل, from uh, next week, I hope everyone will be able to uh, join us. This connection that connects us with Beit al maqdis and the thing that brings us all together is not uh, because it is something that is far away from our heart. Uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Bayt Al-Maqdis is close to every Muslim's heart, to every human who has a, a sense of humanity in their heart. This is a, a, an issue, this is a, a matter that connects all the Muslims across the world, uh, plus uh, it connects us with the world at large when we are talking about the connection with um, uh, with, with uh, the human aspect of, of, of this land. Uh, in this course, we are going to be giving the Islamic perspective, the Islamic timeline on reading Bayt al-Maqdis. We have uh, the Zionists promoting their own uh, uh, ideas. We have the biblical traditions. We have different, uh, various different forms. And what we will be doing in this course is covering over a 10,000 year history. So what we will be doing is just glimpses into this important uh, uh, region. Uh, however, anyone who would like to go further, as uh, Amr mentioned at the beginning, that this is uh, a topic uh, that there is a master program uh, based on, 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 on this uh, subject in, in, in Turkey, a taught master program. Also, there is a, a taught, uh, uh, sorry, another master and PhD program at UUM in Malaysia. Uh, and uh, also there is a master program, a taught master program in Turkey, in Mardin, in English, uh, sorry, in Arabic and in, uh, and in Turkish. Uh, 
this uh, discussion is just a starting point, and it is to give us the foundation on what Beit al Maqdis studies is and the history of uh, Beit al Maqdis in particular. Uh, and anyone who would like to go further in this, there is also an online diploma program that will be announced uh, by the end of this course that hopefully anyone who would like to go further in the subject can uh, can do so uh, through uh, through through different uh, different routes so this is just to give you the grounding and the terminologies and the various different uh, discussions that each muslim and each person who associates with this land needs to uh, uh, to have uh, before I start, uh, I would like to thank uh, Brother Omar Farouk for the recitation, uh, the beautiful verses uh, from the Quran uh, that gives us the barakah of this land and uh, this, this region. So now getting into our uh, discussion, we are discussing Bayt al-Maqdis, uh, if we are able to see the screen. Uh, I hope, yes, we are able to see it. Bayt al uh, uh, and today's topic will be the importance of Al-Aqsa Mosque and Bayt al uh, to, 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 to Islam. Uh, uh, these are the topics that we'll be discussing next week. We'll be talking about the ancient history of Bayt al and Palestine. The following week, the early connections between Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba in the Meccan period. And uh, the uh, following week will be uh, the early connections with Bayt al Maqdis to coming to the Fath of Omar ibn Khattab and the early Muslim times. And then we will come to the Crusades uh, and the Fath of Salah al Din al Ayyubi. And then we will finish this course on the 18th of September. Uh, 2022, and we will be talking about the roots of the current occupation and the future of uh, Beit al Maqdis. And uh, by the end of the course, you will be required to submit one assignment, uh, a reflection, the details of which will be shared with you uh, uh, later, inshallah. So you'll be able, once you submit this, and if you have the attendance, uh, if you've attended at least five of the six classes live, uh, then you will be given the certificate from the, uh, uh, from the university. Uh, we start with talking about a term that many of you have heard of, which is Nakba. Uh, and the Nakba is the occupation of the land. And most people associate the Nakba of the occupation of the land of Beit al Maqdis with the occupation in 1948, when people were expelled from their homes, ethnically cleansed from Palestine. Uh, however, this was not the start of the Nakba. The Nakba actually started way before that. The Nakba started with the British occupation. The British, uh, in 1917, occupied Beit al Maqdis, and uh, they were the ones to set the boundaries of uh, Palestine, uh, and they were the ones to set the, this nationalist uh, uh, idea, and we will be talking about this in, 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 in some detail. However, this occupation is the start of the Nakba, of the catastrophe of the occupation of the land. And this is, uh, uh, interestingly, to the British mind and to the European mind and to the Western mind, this was a continuation of the crusade. The, since the time Salah had been liberated Beit al Maqdis from the Crusader Europeans, this concept of uh, regaining or reoccupying this land was never uh, has never disappeared from uh, European mentality, and we will see this in uh, in the last class uh, as 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 we discuss this in 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 some detail. And what you see uh, here in front of you. I'm sorry. And what you see here uh, in front of you uh, is uh, images from uh, uh, newspapers, uh, uh, newspapers that are discussing and images showing a British soldier shaking hand with uh, uh, a crusader uh, in, in, uh, as, as they have completed this uh, issue. The, uh, this was following the Balfour Declaration, uh, and which we will come to uh, at a later on. But a more dangerous 
uh, issue is the occupation of the mine. And this comes even before the occupation of the land and what we call the intellectual Nakba. The intellectual Nakba is the occupation of the mine. Uh, and this occupation of the mine is way more dangerous than the occupation of the mine. Many of you have uh, uh, commented on the time, why has it been advertised as GMT? Uh, that is part of the occupation of the, 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 the mine. And I'm glad that this is something that all of you became aware of. And from next week, uh, uh, Ramza and Amr have agreed that they will start using we will start using the uh, Beit al maqdistan or Mecca time, which is central to, uh, to Muslims. Uh, so uh, taking, taking this into consideration, but the occupation of the mind doesn't just, uh, is not limited just to with this issue. It actually goes way beyond that. It goes into everything, our educational systems, uh, everything related with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, education with theories, with ideas, with technologies, with everything. Unfortunately, we are living an intellectual Nakba where the Muslim mind is dependent, unfortunately, on the West. And uh, the Muslim mind is uh, uh, dependent uh, on that. And unfortunately, it is not independent. Muslim states, the politics of Muslim states, uh, who created them? Uh, the boundaries, the flags of these states, unfortunately, colonialist uh, uh, occupation, European uh, colonizers have created these boundaries. And, and on the issue of Beit al maqdis the borders of Palestine that we talk about today are actually borders set by the British and the French, uh, not just to Palestine. The geography lecture at the University of Dundee uh, uh, was saying, uh, and and you see this actually on the map, uh, Jordan was drawn with a ruler. Uh, most of the Muslim states, the identity that Muslims carry are identities that have been formed by, uh, by colonialist powers. And unfortunately, part of this is the, uh, uh, the ignoring uh, uh, Muslim identities on this issue, and we will come when 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 I say to you a terminology like al ardul muqaddas, the Holy Land. Uh, it is a Quranic terminology. If you ask any Muslim to explain what the Holy Land is, they will now confuse it with Mecca. They will not be able to even uh, uh, take it to uh, the dimension that it should be uh, at. And this is part of the problem of what we call the intellectual Nakba. Um, you talk about another Quranic terminology, al ardul Mubaraka, the land of Baraka. And you, when you get down into this, uh, most people do not know what the land of Baraka is. But if you ask what is Palestine, people will know the flag of Palestine, the borders of Palestine, uh, which is the uh, colonialist uh, uh, de definition of what Palestine is. All of it, uh, until the end of the Ottoman period, all of it was part of uh, uh, Syria. Today, the Syrian identity is separate from the Jordanian and the Lebanese and the Palestinian identity when they were uh, one, uh, uh, one, one, uh, one identity during the Ottoman period. The boundaries we had before that, the, the divisions, the, the terminologies, uh, things that are related to uh, uh, even the concepts, Islamic concepts, have become alien to Muslims. You mentioned the concepts of uh, Khilafa or the concept of Sharia or the concept of Jihad, and you will find Muslims have Islamophobia uh, of these terminologies. And this is really fascinating that you can understand when non-Muslims have Islamophobia, but when Muslims have Islamophobia, this is the epitome of the intellectual Nakba, the intellectual uh, crisis that the Muslim Ummah is currently going, going through. So this is uh, uh, something that we will try to uh, revive some of these terminologies. So this is part and parcel of the Muslim Aqidah and the Muslim faith, and this needs to be revived. Uh, a Muslim should not shy away from using these terminologies. 
uh, unfortunately, uh, groups uh, have been uh, used uh, to uh, damage or uh, uh, give negative meanings to words like jihad and words like khilafa or words like sharia. And this is uh, not something that a Muslim is ashamed of. These terminologies are part of the faith of a Muslim, even if someone is misrepresenting them, that is not the problem of the, the, the religion religion itself. So going back to the terminologies is something that is important. However, the concept of the Nakba that we're talking about, yes, the Nakba starts with the occupation of the mind, then the occupation of the land in 1917, then the creation of uh, the ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestinians and the occupation in 1948 and then in 1967 until today the Nakbas do not have not stopped uh, and they continue on a daily basis with evictions of people from different parts of the world. One other issue that I uh, in the introductory part and then we will now get into the uh, uh, into the main course uh, is that Muslims love Baytul Maqdis. Muslims love Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. However, this is only a trend. It has become only a trend. When there is something going on, then you will get Muslims uh, responding. And they have not, they, they are only reactive to the issue. The love for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa cannot be doubted, although some are trying to doubt it today with the normalization, with the Zionist state. You can see actually this is getting into a new level uh, where uh, uh, we are discrediting information on Beit al maqdis and Masjid al-Aqsa. However, the love for Masjid al-Aqsa and Beit al maqdis in Palestine amongst the Muslims is genuine and you are a testimony uh, to this. However, this love is not enough. This love has not been able to liberate Beit al maqdis in the last hundred plus years since its occupation in 1917. The Al-Aqsa is still under occupation 105 years later. And this is actually a shame on this Ummah. During the time of Salah al-Din, the Ummah managed to come together 88 years later and managed to liberate Beit al-Maqdis from the Crusader occupation. However, this time we have uh, superseded that and we are in a much more difficult position in this, uh, in this regard. Love needs to turn into... Uh, uh, knowledge and this knowledge, the drive for knowledge is what brings you here today to seek knowledge on Beit al-Maqdis and try to understand what Beit al-Maqdis is and why should it be important if you have this strong foundation with this land and with this subject then you will be able to go to the next step and our motto in the uh, uh, field of Islamic Jerusalem studies is knowledge drives change uh, knowledge on its own is not sufficient. Information on its own is not sufficient. It has to be uh, a knowledge that will drive change. Uh, um, and this change then will drive the liberation and will create the new civilization that uh, will uh, be based in Beit al-Maqdis as Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has mentioned in many of the hadith, the concept of um, Umran Beit al it's the concept of the um, civilization that will be created in, in Beit al-Maqdis. The liberation of Beit al-Maqdis is not a Palestinian issue. It is an issue that relates to the whole of the Muslim world. So this love for Beit al-Maqdis needs to turn into knowledge, and this knowledge turns into action, change, and this change will then lead to the liberation of uh, uh, of, of Beit al-Maqdis. So the first step is the freeing uh, the mind, ending the intellectual nakba, and then what we call the conquest of knowledge, the fath of uh, al-fath al-ma'rifi. And you might you you can watch this uh, uh, episode uh, on uh, the uh, channel that you are on at the moment uh, called Conquest of Knowledge where scholars are talking about the importance of knowledge in the liberation of Beit al-Maqdis. And I would like to quote to you what Salah al-Din said when he liberated the Masjid al-Aqsa. And imagine, people have just liberated it from the Crusaders. Uh, they are rejoicing. 
they have prayed the, the, the four rak'ah of Fath in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, and Salah al Din says to them, Do not think I have liberated this land with your swords. Do not think I have liberated this land with your swords. I have liberated it with the pen of Al Qadi Al Fadi. I didn't liberate it with, uh, with your swords, I liberated it with the knowledge. That the scholar, a scholar like Al Qadil Fadil, who was a great Abdul Rahim al Bisani, he was always by the side of Salah al Din. His uh, letters and his writings is what motivated uh, the the Umara, the princes, and the the the, the um, lay people to work towards the liberation of Al Masjid Al Aqsa. So do not think that it is uh, uh, before actual uh the, the actual conquest before the actual conquest by the sword actually it was the conquest of knowledge is what is needed and at that time we will get into that discussion how salah al din's uh, predecessor particularly nur al din zinki and before that the ulama have laid the foundation for the liberation of Beit al-Maqdis and without this knowledge Beit al-Maqdis needs to become a local issue for those in Kashmir, for those in Pakistan, for those in Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, wherever you are in the West, in the Arab world, wherever you are, this needs to become a local issue and it has to become an issue that you will fight for and we all come together and this is the only equation in which Beitul Maqdis will be liberated. First, we have tried everything over the last hundred years. Tomorrow is the anniversary of the first intifada against the British in 1929, uh, the Burak. And it also it was related to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And it brought the Muslim world together. Uh, ulama from India, from across the whole of the Muslim world, came to a conference in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, uh, after, after this uh, attack on al Burak wall, which we have lost completely. No one talks about al Burak wall. al Burak wall was in the news yesterday, uh, but al Burak wall is part of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's not part of anything Jewish uh, in, this, uh, in this regard. And we will get into the details of this, both in terms of scientifically, archaeologically, and even to Jews. This was not a place that we used to worship until the end of the 19th century. This wall was never important for them, but this then became a national symbol for Jewish Zionism. And then uh, uh, in 1967, when they occupied the Masjid al-Aqsa, they started saying that uh, <coughs> the wall is, uh, uh, is in our hands. And before that, in 1929, they started chanting that they want to take the wall away from al uh, Masjid al-Aqsa. So now getting into our topic, and please, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat section. And at the end of this, uh, we will leave uh, 15 minutes uh, for uh, questions, inshallah, Azza wa So please write your questions and we will try to get to them. So our, our discussion today will start with terminologies, and terminologies are extremely important. And if you've heard of the great Muslim uh, North African philosopher Malik bin Nabi, when he talked about decolonization, decolonization is very, very important. And for us to get through to this level, we need to decolonize the uh, Muslim mind before we decolonize the lands. We might think that there are Muslim independent states, but unfortunately, there are not Muslim independent states. All of them have days of independence, but majority of these states are reliant on the West. They cannot take uh, a decision, they cannot move forward without, and we see this with the normalization with the Zionist state, uh, when Donald Trump uh, blackmailed all, mm, all of these Arab countries to normalize with, with Israel, and they did. Uh, they could not go beyond what he has been, what they, they have been asked to, uh, to do. So it's quite interesting to see uh, this, uh, this uh, discussion uh, going on. And decolonizing the uh, Muslim mind starts with the terminologies and concepts and trying to get out of this and trying to revive 
uh, uh, your own concepts and your own terminologies relating to this uh, issue in, uh, in particular. So the, when we talk about Beit al-Maqdis, uh, it is, or the Holy Land, it is a place that is important to half the world's population. Uh, two, more than two billion Muslims uh, around that uh, of Christians and uh, uh, a few uh, tens of millions of Jews. However, it is a hotbed for conflict. And as we are starting, we need to deconstruct quite a few terminologies, starting with the term Islam. Uh, many Muslims today, when you mention the word Islam, uh, and e even non-Muslims, but uh, it is much actually associated with Muslims than it is with non-Muslims. Uh, uh, Muslims understand the concept of Islam, but they do not understand how to apply it. Uh, we think Islam is, and we see this across all Muslim universities, uh, you have Islamic history. Islamic history only starts with Muhammad. When Islam in the Quran is, this is going back to the intellectual Nakba or the intellectual crisis. This is how you have been put in boxes and you have to think within these boxes. You're not allowed to think outside the box. Islam does not start with Muhammad, the Quran says. Muhammad was not but a messenger. Uh, or the final messenger in this house of Islam. So when does Islam start? The Islam, as Allah says to Muhammad, uh, we have ordained for you the same religion which we have ordained for Nuh. And before that, uh, uh, and we enjoyed on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. So the religion uh, uh, of all the prophets, starting from Adam all the way to Muhammad, is Islam. And the Quran differentiates this clearly in the Quran uh, and uh, the, 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 the concept of this. And this is something that Muslim scholars live uh, with this concept for a very long time. We see this concept in, if you look at the book of Imam al-Tabari or Ibn Kathir or the others, they start the history of Islam with the first human. And this is what we will try to do in this course, is the history of Islam in Bayt al-Maqdis does not start with Umar, does not start with Prophet Muhammad. It actually, Prophet Muhammad was the seal of the prophets that gathered all the prophets into Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al and the, he led them in, in prayer. So the concept of Islam is inheriting the legacies of earlier, earlier prophets and Islam sees itself as the completion of, uh, uh, of, uh, of this. So this is very important in the concept of reading the history of Beit al-Maqdis, is we are reading it from its ancient history, taking it back right to the beginning, uh, to the first human, and we will discuss this uh, uh, as, as we go along. Now, the terminologies associated with Beit al-Maqdis are the following. Uh, for the city and for the region, we have the name Beit al-Maqdis, uh, which in an article that I have uh, published, uh, uh, I claim that this is the earliest name because we have Al-Bayt al-Muqaddas, the holy house, in, uh, in uh, uh, Beit al-Maqdis in Palestine. And we have Al-Bayt al-Haram, and we will get into this discussion later on. However, the earliest record of a name uh, found in this, uh, for this city is the name Or Salim or Or Shalim. And these both names come before even uh, uh, Hebrew uh, was started as a religion, and even before Judaism, uh, sorry, before Hebrew was uh, a language, and even before uh, Judaism was uh, a religion. So this is an important aspect here uh, to bear uh, in mind, is the name uh, Beit, uh, uh, the name Or Salim or Or Shalim is an old Arabic name and it's not, uh, it's not a Hebrew name for the city. And we have records of this 19, uh, in the 19th century BC, so 1900 uh, BC, uh, on uh, Egyptian uh, inscription that mentions the name Or Salim, and it also mentions uh, other cities like Asqalan, 
Ascalon and other cities in that uh, in that uh, region. Uh, the second name that is used for the city is the name Or Salim. Uh, sorry, the name Yabus, but this is first mentioned in the Old Testament. So we do not have any uh, uh, other written records of this uh, of this name. <coughs> Uh, another name that we will come to uh, from after the time of Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, uh, is the name Elia, when Hadirian uh, destroys the city and he builds uh, a new city and he calls it Elia Capitolina and he names the region as Elia. Then we come to the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the use of the name Bayt al-Maqdis. Uh, the name Bayt al-Maqdis was used by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and was also used by uh, uh, the companions and continues to be used today because the reason it continues to be used today is this name is uh, uh, actually uh, uh, mentioned in all the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever he talks about Bayt al-Maqdis, uh, about this land, he's, he mentions the name Bayt al-Maqdis, uh, and he uses it in three contexts, in the context of the masjid, in the context of the city, and in the context of the uh, of the region, the Holy Land, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa. Uh, a few centuries after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we come to the, a new terminology, which is the uh, name Al-Quds. Uh, Al-Quds was introduced by Al-Ma'mun, uh, the Abbasid Khalif, who uh, renovated the uh, city after a number of earthquakes. However, he was problematic in various different uh, dimensions uh, as he tried to, uh, during his time, it was the Mu'tazila and the uh, persecution of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and so on and so forth. This was the time the name Al-Quds was first introduced. Then we have it evolving into Al-Quds Sharif during the uh, Ayyubid, then later, particularly during the Mamluk and the Ottoman period, the name Al-Quds al-Sharif, uh, the new noble uh, uh, Quds, uh, becomes the predominant name in the, uh, of, of, of Beit al-Maqdis. And today we have an East Jerusalem, a West Jerusalem, a Greater Jerusalem, and all these terminologies are based on the um, uh, the new uh, uh, divisions that the British have created when they started developing the western side of the city and then made it particularly for the uh, uh, for the Jews uh, and the Zionists. And then we, from 1948, Jerusalem was split into two. Uh, an eastern part and a uh, western, uh, western part. Uh, coming to the terminologies, we see that Elia was used for the city and the region. Uh, so was the term Beit al as I mentioned to you just a little earlier. The term Beit al was used by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to refer to uh, the region of Beit al -Maqdis. And the region of, of, of Beit al Maqdis, as you can see here in the map on the right hand side, on the top you see the region of Elia, and on the bottom you have the region of Ard al Muqaddasa, or the Holy Land, or the region of Beit uh, al Maqdis. You can see it in this uh, map here. Uh, we mentioned that the Quran gives us two terminologies. The first is Al Ard al Muqaddasa, or uh, 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 the Holy Land, and the second is Al Ard al Mubarak or the land of Barakah. And we see that Al Ard al Muqaddas, the Holy Land, is part of the land of Barakah, which is much wider. Uh, but the uh, what you see here in green, in particular, but if we go to the earlier image, this is a, a much more detailed. Uh, it doesn't fit the administrative boundaries. This is a religious boundary of Bayt al Maqdis. And if there are questions on this, we can explain this further. No one today, you can see this in the Muslim literature, Muslim scholars of the past knew of these boundaries very well. And they were very well aware of these, uh, uh, the extent of these uh, boundaries and the extent of these lands. Uh, you see this in the, the, the narration of uh, uh, Abu Ubaidah, uh, 
uh, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, and the guardian of uh, this Ummah, Amin al-Ummah, as Rasulullah called him. When time of his death came, he asked to be buried in Al-Ard al-Muqaddasa, in the Holy Land, west of the River Jordan. Uh, uh, this was his wasiyah, his will. Uh, and you can see he was aware of this. The Hadith in Bukhari gives us that Musa alayhi salam asked to be, to be brought as close as possible as a stone throw away from uh, the land, uh, from Al-Ard uh, al-Muqaddasa. And you, you see uh, Abu Ubaid, uh, the author of Najaz al-Qur'an, and al-Istakhri, al-Maqdisi, all Muslim geographers until recently, until recent times, uh, Muslim scholars were aware of the extent of the Holy Land and the extent of Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa and uh, of, of, of Bayt, uh, Bayt al-Maqdis today, which we unfortunately are not aware of. And many of you might have seen this map for the uh, first time uh, in, in, in your life. It extends around the uh, city of Bayt al-Maqdis and extends to cover uh, up to, uh, uh, from the center, uh, about a radius of 80, uh, 85 uh, uh, kilometers. This is the extent of Al-Ard Al-Muqaddas. It even has territorial water. As Al-Maqdisi mentions, 12 miles into the sea, 12 Arab miles, which is about 25 uh, kilometers into the sea. This is the extent of the land of uh, the Holy Land, Al-Ard Al-Muqaddas, or the land of Bayt. Uh, al, al, al Maqdis, and I was there recently in Karak, and you can see Karak is next to Mu'ta in southern Jordan today. Uh, it, the, it is part of Jordan today, but it is part of the holy, uh, the holy land. So Bayt al Maqdis was used by the Prophet وسلم, to refer to Al Masjid al Aqsa in particular, for example, when he said, when uh, uh, Yahya salam, Allah asked him to gather the people in Bayt al Maqdis, so they gathered until they overflow to the balconies. So this, in this hadith, it is referring particularly to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and Rasulullah uses the term also Al-Bayt Al-Muqaddas, the holy house. So like we have Al-Bayt Al-Haram for the Kaaba, it is Al-Bayt Al-Muqaddas for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The second terminology is Bayt Al-Muqaddas as the city. When Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can see this in the far, uh, in, in the, on the far right, uh, Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, uh, when he uh, comes on the night journey, he says, we entered Bayt al-Maqdis, I tied the burak, and then we entered the masjid. So he differentiates between the uh, masjid and also with the, uh, with the uh, city. And also in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is talking about uh, Bayt al-Maqdis as the region. When he says about Yusha, uh, when he was going to uh, liberate part of Bayt al-Maqdis, uh, he was going into Jericho, not to the actual city, but Rasulullah mentioned it as part of Bayt al-Maqdis. And another hadith, Ard al-Mahshar al-Mahshar, it is a land of raising and gathering, go and pray in it, he's talking about it in the sense of the region. And now, to make this interactive, we have 280 people with us live. Jazakumullah khair for your patience. And uh, please, if you have questions, please write your uh, questions in the comment section. But to make this more interactive, I know some of you might know this, so I'm giving you three options to choose from. We are talking about what is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And you are given three options. Option one is the building with the golden dome that you see here in front of you. Option two is the building with the uh, silver dome. So please write one, two, or three. So if you believe it is number uh, one, the building with the golden dome, please uh, uh, write number one. If you believe it's the building number with uh, number two with the uh, copper uh, silvery dome, please uh, press uh, number uh, number two as we are. Uh, continuing our uh, discussion. Uh, so just to, uh, we'll, we'll try to do this uh, as much as possible to keep everyone uh, inter, uh, uh, as part of an interactive uh, discussion. 
uh, try to uh, see what is Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Is Al Masjid Al Aqsa this? Uh, uh, let's go back to the earlier image. So we have, if we are able to zoom in, yes. So we are looking at uh, uh, a building here with a golden dome. That's option one. The building here with the uh, copper, uh, not copper, uh, uh, silvery, uh, silvery dome. Uh, there's another word, lead, lead dome. Yes, this the number two, or it is something else. It is number uh, three. So I can see the answers coming in as we are speaking. So some believe it is number one. Uh, uh, and some believe it is number two. This is the first time that actually there is a big split. Uh, I thought we have gone over this. Uh, some of you have given the right answer and some of you are still confused on this. Those who have given the right answer is are so far, uh, let's say nine, ten people. Uh, and the rest are either, either going for one or two. Uh, and those who are going for three already know the, the correct answer. The answer is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is neither the building with the golden dome, neither the building with the silver dome. Al-Aqsa existed before these buildings were even created. So what is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? What existed when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes on the night journey is you see these walls, and let me zoom in to them. You can see these walls here. These walls existed before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. And before even Isa alayhi sallam was born. So when we are talking about al-Masjid al-Aqsa, we are talking about the compound in which these buildings have been built. So it is everything that you see here in front of you in color, all of this is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And the Muslims, after the Fath of Umar ibn Khattab, started constructed build, constructing buildings within Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. So the majority of you, uh, given those who said answer one, are correct. No, they are wrong, but they're also correct because the Dome of the Rock is part of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The Dome of the Rock is part of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The other building with the lead dome, it is part of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa because it was built inside it. So you need to think now outside of the, the, the box that you, it is a single building. And that takes us into the uh, uh, concept of what a masjid is. And I will come back and revisit this. But as you can see here in the image in front of you, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa has hundreds of structures and buildings within it. So it's not just, you can see the minarets, where the minarets are. You can see the minarets are not sitting. Um, let's, let us show the, you this a little clearer. So you can see the minarets are delineating, showing us the extent of uh, the borders of the masjid from the north here, from the west here, and you can see another two here on the western side. You can see the gates of the masjid al-Aqsa. There are more than 18 gates. Ten of them are open today. Uh, the other eight are sealed. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is, you can see the, 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 the main two buildings, the biggest two buildings are the Dome of the Rock and Al-Jami Al-Aqsa. But the center of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is this dome here, the Dome of the Chain. The Dome of the Chain sitting next left of the Dome of the Rock is the exact center of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and Mubarak. And we will get into some detail that Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is, and you see these ancient walls that uh, surround Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa from the four directions. These ancient walls take us back to the start of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, taking us back two centuries. But the main two buildings you can see in this image here, this is the Dome of the Spirits here to our left. Uh, actually, let me uh, add the laser pointer so you can see where I'm pointing at. This dome here is called the Dome of the uh, Spirit, the Qubbatul Arwah. This dome here uh, is known as the Dome of the uh, Mi'raj, Dome of Ascension. This dome here is the Dome of uh, 
the Prophet uh, or the dome of the Mihrab of the Prophet. The dome here is the dome of the uh, uh, chain and on the center of this is the dome of the rock. As you look at Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa actually uh, is built on a mountain. So this mountain, you can see here the bedrock uh, of, of, of the mountain. This mountain, the dome of the rock sits right at the top of the mountain, which is uh, the top of it is the rock that uh, Al-Aqsa was built uh, upon. Underneath the golden dome is this rock. And this rock is important because this was the first tabla of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from the rock, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, ascends to uh, heaven. So Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is one, the dome of the rock, two, the dome of, uh, sorry, the Al-Jami' al Al-Aqsa, and everything in between them and everything around them. Uh, and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is that Allah mentions in the Quran, and we will come to the concept of what a masjid is. A masjid does not need a dome or a minaret. A masjid needs three things. You need to allocate the place, uh, the, the, the site, and then you uh, delineate the boundaries, and then you choose the direction of the, the, the qibla, and that is what makes a masjid. At the center is the Dome of the Rock, and the name comes from the rock itself, the rock, uh, the Qibla of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, he prayed towards during the Meccan period and for a year and a half in Medina. This is the uh, rock that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and as I mentioned, it extends across the whole of the building. The other building is known as Al-Jami' Al-Aqsa, Al-Aqsa Congregational Building or Al-Mughatta or Al-Qibli, the southern structure. Uh, the reason it is called Qibli, it is, it, Qibli literally means southern, the southern building of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So you can see it sits right and in the southern uh, uh, building. You can also see in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa there is a, a basement, and the basement is bigger even than Al-Jami' Al-Aqsa uh, uh, and can house more worshippers. But actually the majority of the Muslims will pray in the courtyards around these buildings and not the buildings themselves. And the Masjid Al-Aqsa, as Abdullah ibn Abbas mentioned, every, every hand span uh, uh, there in it, a prophet has made sujood or an angel has stood. So every inch in the Masjid Al-Aqsa has a story with you. There was where Ibrahim prayed, where Isa prayed, where Musa alayhi salam, where Maryam, where Sulaiman, where uh, Adam, where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wherever you place your forehead on the ground in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, a prophet there has prayed and placed his forehead on the ground well before you. Al-Jami' Al-Aqsa or the Qibli is uh, where the Imam leads the prayer and you can see the majority will be praying outside uh, uh, the structures because the structures cannot house everyone uh, within uh, within that. The exact center of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, as I mentioned, is the dome of the uh, chain, not the dome of the rock. The dome of the rock is at the heart of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. What we will be covering over the next six weeks is uh, around 12, 13, 15, 20,000 uh, 20, years of history of Bayt al maqdis And what we will be running, we will be running through two different channels. One is the uh, uh, the rulers that ruled this land, started with the Natufians, the Canaanites. The Natufians are the first to build uh, uh, cities in Beit al-Maqdis. And the first city, the oldest city in the world, is found actually in Beit al-Maqdis. And it is the city of, uh, uh, it, it is the city of Jericho. Um, uh, about 20 uh, kilometers from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak and they date back 12,000 BC before uh, Common Era, uh, BCE. Uh, we have the Canaanites, we have the Hexos, we have the Egyptian, the Jebusites, uh, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantine, the Persians, all the way until the Muslims. But we will be running through another timeline, which is the Quranic timeline which runs us with starting with Adam, Nuh, and then Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, Musa, 
Yusha, uh, Dawood and Sulaiman, and numerous prophets between them, all the way to Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, and Maryam, <coughs> alayhi wasalam, all the way to Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi uh, wasallam. Um, so we move now to a second part of our discussion. Uh, I hope the first point is clear. Uh, now moving to the second part of the discussion is why is Al-Aqsa important for Muslims? This area that is 142,000 square meters, why is it important to Muslims around the world today? Why should Muslims in wherever you are listening to us from, why should this issue become a priority for yourself? Why should it become an issue that you live uh, you live for <coughs> why should it become it is not a nationalistic issue it is not a Palestinian issue why should it be an issue for you as much as it is <coughs> sorry as, as much as it is important for your Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine this is not an issue for Palestinians. If it was an issue for Palestinians, then Salah al-Din was not a Palestinian. Uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid was not a Palestinian. Nor was Umar ibn Khattab a Palestinian. This issue is for every... And today, who are Palestinians? Uh, if you go to Palestine today, they are... You will find your roots in Beit al -Maqdis. You will find my city, Al-Khalid, where I come from, uh, is a third of it is Kurds. They came with Salah al-Din Another third are uh, Tamimi. They lived in Beit. They were Arabs. They were living in Beit al maqdis even before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam. They were they were Christian Arabs and they accepted Islam. Actually, the priest from uh, the city that I come from, uh, Tamim comes to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, accepts Islam and becomes a Muslim. And Rasulullah endows him, gives him waqf, his land, until the day, day, day of judgment. So we can see that the, 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 this issue is not a Palestinian issue per se. And Palestinians are actually a mixture of people who represent the whole of the Muslim Ummah uh, today. Uh, last In my last visit to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, we were walking towards uh, one of the gates uh, and behind us there were black Palestinians. And my wife was shocked uh, at hearing that they were speaking with a strong Palestinian Jerusalemite accent. And she said to me, they cannot be Palestinian. How are they black? They came from, actually they came centuries ago from Nigeria, Niger, and settled in, in, in Beit al-Maqdis. Next to Al-Buraq wall was the North African quarter, and they settled there. There is an Indian Zawiya, there is uh, an Afghani Zawiya, uh, there is a Kurdish Zawiya. Uh, all of this, uh, there is a rebat for the, from, from uh, the people of, of Mardin in Turkey. Uh, the people of Beit al-Maqdis represent uh, the whole of the Muslim Ummah today. So this is a very important point, point to bear in mind, that this issue is yours as much as it is for me. This issue is uh, the issue of the Ummah and the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa will not come from Palestine. Uh, the people of Palestine will continue to fight and resist this occupation on behalf of this Muslim Ummah. What you saw last Ramadan and the Ramadan before that, the, 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 the people there are calling on the Muslim Ummah uh, to wake up. Because this is, if I, this is a, an issue that is not uh, for Palestinians because this Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa belongs to all the Muslims. Uh, you, some of you might find this strange that the way this is being represented is a nationalistic issue. Uh, it is not a nationalistic issue. If I told you uh, a similar scenario happened in Mecca, uh, that uh, Mecca is under, uh, uh, say, American direct American occupation, and to go inside the Kaaba, uh, to go around, uh, to make tawaf, to go for Hajj or Umrah, you have to ask permission from the uh, uh, Americans directly. 
And when you are going, when you go there, God forbid this scenario, when you are going there while you are making tawaf, you're being shot at by American non-Muslim soldiers. How would that make you feel? Would you say, well, this is a Saudi matter. I have nothing to do with this issue. Uh, uh, this is an issue that corresponds with every single Muslim around the world. And it is your duty to be liberating al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And you need to put this on your agenda. This is something that you cannot leave behind. Allama Muhammad Iqbal, the great Indian Allama, <coughs> uh, scholar uh, and poet, he says, after you teach your child la ilaha illallah, you have to teach them the love of al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Al-Masjid al-Aqsa is part of your aqidah. It is a verse in the Quran. Actually, the most of the Quran, the geography of the Quran is Bayt al-Maqdis, is al-Masjid al-Aqsa, and this is the land of the prophets. So it is part of your inheritance in, in the sense that you are uh, uh, a Muslim. If you uh, call yourself that today, then this is part of your aqidah and part of your, uh, part of your uh, uh, faith. So what we are discussing, how was it important? And if it was important for us as Muslims, then we need to try to understand what it meant for our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if it was important for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it should be automatically important for you. If it was important for Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa sallam, then automatically it is an issue that then makes it uh, an issue that you are connected with and something that you uh, need to uh, reconnect yourself uh, with. So starting with what Bayt al-Maqdis meant for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what Bayt al-Maqdis, why is Bayt al-Maqdis and al-Aqsa important for us as Muslims, we'll come and revisit some of this. So I would skip through it pretty quickly uh, to try to uh, leave the uh, some time for a question at the at the end. Al Masjid Al Aqsa is some uh, you've heard some Jewish voices, Zionist voices saying Al Aqsa is your third holiest place, <coughs> while for the Jews it is number one, uh, and for Muslims it's number three. I don't know where we got this from. Uh, that Al-Aqsa is number three, when Al-Aqsa was number one for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was his first Qibla. It was also number two. It was the second mosque built on earth. When we look at the history of the world, when we look at the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Bayt al-Maqdis was number one for him. When we look at the history of the world and the history of prophets, the Al-Aqsa is number two, being built 40 years after the Kaaba. And we'll come to this. And also it is one of three places every Muslim should set out to visit. So Al-Aqsa is not the third holiest place for Muslims. This is a terminology or a concept that needs to be corrected. It's actually number one as the first Qibla, number two as the second mosque built in earth, and one of three places every Muslim should set, set out to uh, uh, visit. So it actually created a connection between the Sahaba, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it was the Qibla of the Prophets that came before him. So it created that link between Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Qibla of the Prophets that came before him, and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, standing up and praying towards this place. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam built the first mosques in Medina, they were built facing towards Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. So now this connection was set in stone uh, with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, Al-Mubarak. And as Abdullah ibn Abbas mentions in a Sahih Hadith that is mentioned in Musnad Ahmad the Isnad of which is Sahih, uh, that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while in Mecca used to pray towards Bayt Al-Maqdis uh, uh, and uh, uh, through the whole of the Meccan, uh, Meccan period. We'll get into the details of this as we go along, but it created a very st strong spiritual connection between the Muslims and Bayt al-Maqdis until the Qibla uh, changed from Bayt al-Maqdis to the uh, Kaaba, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that prescribed it as the Qibla. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا الْقِبْلَةَ الَّتِي كُنْتَ عَلَيْهَا We have not set uh, the Qibla that you used to create towards, to, uh, towards except to know who will follow the messenger from those who will turn back 
uh, on their two uh, heels. This was a test, not just for them, but a test you see the, the wider context, context in which Allah made Bayt al Maqdis the first Qibla for Muslims. Al Masjid al Aqsa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also made the second mosque built on earth. And we know that the first building on earth is the Kaaba. And we know this from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in the awwala bayti mudi ali nasi ladi bakata mubarak, the first building, the first structure built on earth is that in uh, uh, in, in, in Mecca. May I ask you just to, so we, I can keep your engagement, uh, uh, who built the Kaaba? Would you please answer, right? Who you think uh, first built the Kaaba? Uh, I look forward to your answers. Uh, when Ibrahim alayhi salam comes to uh, Mecca, uh, he rebuilds the, the Kaaba. But my question, was he the first one to build it? I answered the question. Or did the Kaaba exist before him? So please write your answers. Uh, if we look at the Kaaba, the Kaaba wasn't in this Jazakumullah uh, uh, Khair, Rashida, starting with Mumtaz, uh, Rashida and the others, all going back to Adam alayhi salam. And that is the right answer. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one that rebuilt the Kaaba. And as evidence of this, the Quran says actually, where the Arfa Ibrahim al Qawaid bin al Bayt, Ibrahim was raising the foundations. But th this is uh, uh, a verse, if you see in, in Surah Ibrahim, verse 37, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when Ismail was still a baby, uh, he makes this dua, he leaves them next to the Kaaba and he says, Rabbana inni askantu min thuriyati biwadin ghayri dizar and end the al haram. <coughs> oh Allah, I'm leaving some of my offspring next to your sacred house. So the Kaaba existed, and this is uh, 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 an agreement amongst Muslim scholars when they look at the tafsir of the first verse that I mentioned to you earlier, that they are talking about the time of Adam alayhi uh, salam. From the time of Adam alayhi salam, the Kaaba existed, because here the verse, it wasn't built for angels or jinn or others, it was built for humans. Uh, 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 as Rumaisa is uh, rightly saying, that the angels uh, uh, have a different Kaaba uh, situated exactly above the Kaaba in the heavens. But Allah says in the Quran, in the awwala baytim wudi alinnas, for humankind, the first house, the first structure, the first building, the first place of worship is the Kaaba. And it cannot, Allah could, could not have left humanity without a place to worship until Ibrahim comes. Ibrahim alayhi salam rebuilt the uh, Kaaba uh, uh, after it was, after it had existed at the time of Adam alayhi salam. But my question is, what is the shape of the Kaaba? Is the Kaaba a square? Uh, what is the shape of the current Kaaba today? Uh, can someone help me out uh, in answering this? As you are looking at this uh, uh, image, it will help you. Uh, most people think that actually the Kaaba is a cube. Uh, it is a full square. Is that true? Uh, Shema or Shima is saying it's a cube. But I just showed you the image. I, I, uh, I thought you would uh, uh, get it from the image. You see, this is an aerial view of the Kaaba today. Every wall in the Kaaba has a different dimension. And you might say, why is that? It is not square. Every wall in the Kaaba, as you can see here, 13 meters, 12 meters, 11 meters, and 10, 10 meters. Every wall has a different dimension. And the Kaaba was, uh, before that, uh, much longer. So the Kaaba used to extend to include this part. And we know this from Sahih Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu And you all know the story when uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu the issue of placing black stone before his prophethood. The people of Mecca rebuilt the Kaaba and this part of the Kaaba they excluded. So if you go to the Kaaba next time uh, to, to, to Mecca, you can enter into Hijr Ismail. But if you pray here, as Rasulullah told Aisha radiallahu anha, when she wanted after the conquest of Mecca to pray inside the Kaaba, Rasulullah says, if you pray here in the first uh, few cubits, uh, then it is as if you have prayed inside the, uh, the Kaaba. Because when your people 
uh, uh, rebuilt the Kaaba, they had excluded this part. So you can see uh, this, some of you might have seen this for the first time, that the Kaaba is much longer, used to be much longer than it is uh, today. And uh, this is the uh, part in the first uh, uh, four meters of uh, the Hijr of Ismail. This is known as al haqim which means the uh, destroyed part of the Kaaba. And this is why Islamically you're not allowed, to, while you're making tawaf, you're not allowed to cross over. You have to go around this area, otherwise your tawaf does not, does not count. So the building of the Kaaba at the time of Ibrahim السلام, and we know this from the books of Imam Fakihi, Imam Al-Azraqi, from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, from Abdullah ibn Zubair who dug into the foundation of the Kaaba and we have measurements of the original shape and the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, tells us that when Ibrahim built the Kaaba he built it without a roof and he built it with uh, two doors, you would enter from one and exit from the other. And uh, this is the shape of the Kaaba at the time of Ibrahim alayhi uh, as -salam. Uh, This is what it would have looked like. Every wall had a different dimension. The longest wall would be about 18 meters in our measurements today, 17 meters uh, the other side and uh, uh, maybe 12 and 10 uh, 10, 10 meters, and we have records of this in the books of the histories of, uh, uh, of, of Mecca. Now you might tell me, what is this to do with Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? The reason I'm discussing this is we're discussing Al-Aqsa is the second mosque on earth, so we need to understand the first mosque on earth. So now we look at the old city, what you see here in front of you is the old city of Beit al-Maqdis, uh, this is the old Ottoman walls that were built by Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, Qanuni Suleiman. Uh, he built them, and these are the walls of the city today uh, from the Ottoman period. Al Masjid al Aqsa makes a sixth of the old city. Uh, I told you 142,000 uh, 142, square meters. That is the size of 35 football fields. It's a massive area, not a small area. The Masjid Al-Aqsa can house up to 300,000 people at the same time. It used to be known as the biggest mosque in the world, after, uh, after which, uh, uh, until the 1980s, when the Saudis have expanded the Kaaba and Masjid Al-Haram and Masjid Al-Nabawi in Mecca and Medina. But until then, until the 1980s, Al-Aqsa, if you open the Muslim geographers, and their writings, Al-Aqsa is the biggest mosque in the world. Second to it was uh, the mosque of Qurtuba in Andalus, uh, and then the, the, the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. So Al-Aqsa is known as the biggest mosque in the, in the world. Uh, you can see what is the shape of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. You can see each wall in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa has also a different dimension. You can see the Western wall, where Al Burak wall is, is 488 meters. You know how much that is? That's about half a kilometer. Uh, the eastern wall is 466, the southern wall 281, and the northern wall 314. And Masjid Al Aqsa is a massive, massive area, massive structure, and also it's an irregular uh, rectangle. And the question is, uh, as Rumaysa, uh, Rumaysha is writing, is it, was it Sulaiman that built the Masjid al-Aqsa or was it someone else? Let me know by your answers. Uh, Al-Kaaba, please write your answers in the, uh, uh, in the um, comment section so we can follow that. We agreed that the first to build the Al-Aqsa, uh, sorry, the first to build the Kaaba, the Kaaba existed at the time of Adam salam. Now, who first built the Masjid al-Aqsa? Uh, I look forward to your answers. But now you can see there is a similarity between Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba. Uh, until we get to, to, to that, please uh, answer uh, the question. You can see there is a similarity between them. And actually, this similarity is uh, the work of uh, 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 the one that discovered this is Dr. Haytham Arathrut, who is an architect and an engineer. Uh, and... Uh, 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 an architect uh, and an archaeologist and in his work in which he studies Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and I really recommend that you 
uh, read the book uh, in which he, it is the most detailed book on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, and I will share the name with you in, if you give me one second. I'm at my office at the university. This is the book uh, by Dr. Haytham Aratrut. This is actually his PhD thesis, and it is the most detailed study uh, done on Al Masjid Al Aqsa Al Mubarak during the early Muslim period. The title of the book is The Architectural Development of Al Aqsa Mosque in the Early Islamic Period Sacred Architecture in the Shape of the Holy by Dr. Haytham Aratrut. Uh, uh, after he finished this, uh, he came across uh, the similarities and he published this in the Journal of Islamic Jerusalem Studies, which, by the way, you will find this and the, uh, uh, the journal uh, on the website of, um, on the e-library uh, of uh, Islamic Jerusalem uh, uh, Waqf, the Waqf of Beit al maqdis which uh, was mentioned as one of the organizers of this uh, of this event um, so you can uh, um, uh, see this book you can download it as PDF and other books uh, also uh, you can find them together with the journal which Dr. Haytham uh, discussed uh, this similarities between the Kaaba and the Masjid al -Aqsa. And what is fascinating, we're looking at the ratios uh, between Al-Aqsa uh, and the Kaaba. And they look a bit similar. We said each wall is uh, at a different dimension. But what you will see here is that when you copy this, it's a mirror image. The Al-Aqsa is a mirror image of the Kaaba. And this cannot be a coincidence because it goes beyond that, what Dr. Haytham writes about. The angles here, it is 85 degrees, exactly 85 degrees on the other side, in the Kaaba. 92 degrees and 92 degrees, 90 degrees and 90 degrees. And this cannot be a coincidence. This is an identical uh, uh, copy, Al-Aqsa is an identical copy of the Kaaba, but at a larger scale. Or you can say the Kaaba is an identical copy of Al-Aqsa, but at a smaller scale. But which one comes first? We will know this from the word of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we come to who built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. What the answers that are coming, uh, some uh, are saying Dawood, Sulaiman, some are saying uh, Adam. Uh, yes, this is uh, Shima is giving the uh, the, the the right uh, answer, uh, and I will get into uh, into that and how we know this. This similarity in the building means actually that uh, the builder from uh, uh, an architectural, from an archaeological uh, architectural point of view. Uh, what we see is such similarity. It means that the builder is one, or he must have copied it from uh, the other the other structure. Which one comes first in terms of architecture and archaeology is the Kaaba comes first because Al Aqsa, with its original foundations, Al Aqsa, with its original foundations, is built facing towards the <coughs> the Kaaba, Al Aqsa. Al-Aqsa's ancient foundations, which have existed before the time of Muhammad, which existed before the time of Isa, which existed uh, before the time of Musa, السلام, before Judaism, the foundations of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa are facing towards the Kaaba, which means that Al-Aqsa comes after the Kaaba. What is interesting here is that the, the Jews claim that this is a temple, a Jewish temple or it was a Roman temple. Today, archaeology tells us that the foundation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa goes back to the time of the Roman period, at the time of uh, uh, Hadrian in the second century, or you can say the time of Herod. This is the discussion, or in parts of the world go back to uh, the time of the, uh, the Greeks. <clears throat> What's interesting is nor to the Greeks, nor to the Jews, nor to the Romans, does the Kaaba have any significance? And Al-Aqsa, 
with its ancient foundations, is facing towards the Kaaba, which means this was never a Jewish temple. This was never uh, 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 something apart from being a masjid across the centuries. The question is, who built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? Uh, you have given us so many different answers. And okay, let's make it easier. How long between the building of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba? I will give you three options, right? One, two, three. 4,000 years is option one. 400 years is option two. 40 years is option three. So 4,000 years, 400 years, or four, or 40 years. So you have three options. Number one, 4,000. Number two, 400. Number three, 40 years. Okay, I can see the answers coming, starting with uh, uh, 4,000 years, 40 years, uh, 40 years. MashaAllah, you guys are uh, with us following. Uh, very good. Option three. How do we know it is 40 years? You cannot, uh, no archaeological evidence can confirm this. How do we know it was 40 years between the building of Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba? Do you know what that actually means? If you say 40 years, that from the time of Adam Islam, both buildings were built. <clears throat> if you say 4,000 years, maybe it means, yes, Sa Sauda Ismail gave the right answer. Uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us this, the hadith. It is 40 years. The hadith, Abu Dhar, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him, comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, what is the first mosque built in earth? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, the first mosque is Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the Kaaba. He says, what is the second mosque built in earth? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He says, how long between the building uh, of Al-Masjid Al-Haram and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? He says, 40 years. And Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, this hadith is mentioned in Bukhari, and uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in his charah, he says the building between Al-Aqsa and uh, uh, Al-Masjid, uh, 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 the Kaaba and Al-Aqsa is 40 years, and both of them were built at the time of Prophet Adam alayhi salam. So both of them existed from the time of Prophet Adam alayhi, uh, alayhi salam. So it is 40 years, and this Actually, uh, in the paper that Dr. Haytham wrote on the comparison between the Kaaba and the Masjid Al-Aqsa, there's a lot more detail to it, but it shows you that these were, the, the, he says, this confirms the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that the builder is one. 40 years at the time of Adam salam is a very short period of time when they lived for hundreds of years. So in this sense, uh, Imam Hajar, Ibn, uh, Ibn Hisham, and the majority of Muslim scholars on this say Al-Aqsa, between the building of Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba is 40 years, and both of them were built at the time of Adam alayhi salam. These were the first two centers of monotheism on earth. When I tell you Al-Aqsa is yours, is much as I'm telling you that the Kaaba is yours. This is part of your Iman, this is part of your Aqidah, this is part of your... Um, uh, faith and later on many prophets came like Ibrahim alayhi salam rebuilt al-Aqsa uh, rebuilt the Kaaba with Adam alayhi, with his son Ismail alayhi salam he also rebuilt al-Aqsa according to some narrations with Ishaq alayhi salam and it was rebuilt again by other prophets and we will get into the discussion on Suleiman and Dawood later on and if Suleiman and Dawood rebuilt the Masjid al-Aqsa does this, does this give the Jews any right over it? Uh, this was always a masjid. Uh, well, this was not a Jewish temple uh, in the sense uh, uh, it was always a masjid for the whole of the believers around the world. Whoever says la ilaha illallah at that time, this was a masjid for them. And we will get into the discussion when Ibrahim salam, comes to this land. Already, this is in, mentioned in the Torah, in the Old Testament, already. Uh, Malik Sadiq, the king of Salem, the uh, king of Jerusalem, uh, the king of Beit al-Maqdis, was worshipping God, 
the most high in al masjid al aqsa in the area of al masjid al aqsa and ibrahim al islam prayed with him there so it's quite interesting uh, uh, an interesting point to bear in mind this according to the quran this is the land of the prophets this is where 25 prophets mentioned in the quran where were they the majority of them were in Bayt al-Maqdis. The majority of the prophets were around al-Masjid al-Aqsa. And <clears throat> just before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 600 years before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this was where Maryam alayhi wa was. This was where um, uh, Isa alayhi wa was born. This was where, uh, 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 where Zakaria and Yahya, Dawood and Sulaiman and Ibrahim and Ishaq and Yusuf and Ismail was born there even. And then he was taken to, uh, uh, to Mecca. So you can see the connection uh, that this place has. So it takes us back to the time of Adam alayhi salam. So the building of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa starts with the first human on this earth. Uh, uh, starting uh, on this uh, on this uh, issue, and we will talk more on the other point. As I mentioned at the beginning, Al Aqsa is not the third holiest place for Muslims, and I will try to wrap up the discussion with uh, the reward of Masjid Al Aqsa and the reward of visiting it. In the situation, we will end up with the situation uh, uh, today, inshallah. Uh, Al Aqsa is one of three. Masajid, every Muslim should set out to visit. What does that mean? Uh, <clears throat> one of three places, not the third. And why this is important, this is part of uh, um, correcting the terminologies. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith uh, mentioned in Bukhari and in Muslim, narrated by Abu Sa'id al Khudari. Uh, he says, uh, you should not set out to visit except three, for the sake of worship, except three mosques. Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, wa Masjid Al-Hab. The Kaaba, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina. He put them in this order. Another hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah, he says, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He mentions Al-Aqsa as uh, uh, not in the same order. Think of it in this. If I tell you before you die, you need to visit three places. I do not mean them in the order. And the Prophet Sallallahu here is not mentioning it in that same uh, order. Uh, uh, on the issue of reward of Salah, reward of Salah in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, is uh, most of the hadith on the reward of Salah in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa are rather weak. Uh, for this reason, uh, uh, this is what people base that Al-Aqsa is the third holiest based on the reward of prayer. But I'm going to challenge this with uh, hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu says that whoever uh, comes to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa for the sake of praying in it, will not leave until his all his sins are forgiven. And this only happens somewhere else, which is in uh, Hajj. And Hajj, if it is Mabrur, if it is accepted, not every Hajj will get uh, this uh, same, same, same reward. And this is a dua of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and dua of Sulaiman Alayhi Salaam, which we will come back to uh, later on. But Rasulullah wanted to connect these twins Al-Aqsa and the Kaaba together. How do you connect them together? It is by uh, making, uh, uh, starting your Hajj from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa or starting your Umrah from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa as we see in the hadith that you see here in front uh, of you. Uh, the situation today, which we will end uh, our discussion here in the next 10 minutes with, uh, and then we will uh, engage with some questions. So please, if you uh, have not been reading the questions, I get some glimpses of some of the comments every now and then. But please, if you do have, if you have questions, please re uh, uh, copy and paste your questions so I can read them as I finish in the next uh, few uh, few minutes. Al-Aqsa has been under occupation since 1967, direct Zionist occupation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa since 1967. This is a shame on this Ummah that the 
Qibla, the first Qibla of the Muslim is still under occupation uh, uh, 55 uh, years down the line. And this is an Ummah that uh, needs to move towards the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. And we will get into this discussion, what we can do for the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But we are today on the first step. It is to gain knowledge, knowledge that will make you, will drive change, and change that will drive liberation of faith and maqdis, inshallah. So today, Muslims who are living just a few kilometers away are unable to reach Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, sometimes it is easier for you to come and visit from Europe or from South Africa or other places than someone. The two, three million people living in Gaza, the majority of them have never seen Al-Aqsa in their life. They only live 80 kilometers away from uh, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, but they have not seen Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in their lifetime. Uh, what is happening today in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is uh, persecution of Muslims, but today it is getting very, very, very dangerous. It is getting into a very dangerous stage where Al-Aqsa, we, we are losing Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa every day. Today, Zionists are able to pray inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Today, the sign at the gate of Magariba, which said that Jews, according to the Torah, are not allowed into the site, is no longer there. Zionist Jewish religious groups are pushing the limits on this issue, and this ummah is doing nothing. Are you we waiting to lose the Masjid Al-Aqsa completely before this Ummah will wake up? Is a question that I would like you to think about as we continue our discussion. This is an image that will remind you of the Izza of the Muslim Ummah. This image was taken 114, sorry, 113 years ago. In 1331 after Hijra, today we are in 1444. And this was the Ottoman Muslim army. And you can see on the top, it is written, Nasrun min Allah wa fathun qareeb. Victory from Allah and a close fatah, inshallah, azza wa And the year you can see here, and you can see the hafad and the, the soldiers and the dignitaries, all of them there before going to fight against uh, uh, battles against uh, non-Muslims, Al-Aqsa was always a stage where the starting point took place. After we lost Beit al-Maqdis, these are the images of losing Beit al-Maqdis in 1917, where the city was brought under British occupation, the end of the crusade, as Allenby, who's here on top of the horse, said, today the crusades have ended, uh, as he proclaimed uh, the proclamation in front of the, his soldiers and in front of the dignitaries of the city. From that time, the British set control to what Palestine is and who Palestinian, who is a Palestinian. After setting the borders of Palestine, and then we move towards the uh, occupation of Palestine uh, in 1948, in 1967. And today, what is left is literally nothing. All of Palestine is under occupation. In 1948, 78% uh, of Palestine was, was ethnically cleansed. They would go, and you've heard some uh, of the massacres that have taken place, and some of the Israeli archive has been released on the amount of massacres, some of the massacres that have taken place uh, in 1948 in what they called the War of Independence. Uh, in 1967, Al-Aqsa was occupied. The uh, tanks, uh, Al-Burak wall was taken. Uh, Zionist uh, vehicles were inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, the Israeli flag was raised above the Dome of the Rock. Uh, Al-Burak wall was taken. Moshi Dayan that you here see in front of you uh, walking into Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The first thing they did after they took Al-Burak wall, they destroyed 130 houses of Waqf property. 
endowment, which is uh, was endowed at the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, sorry, at the time of his son al-Afdal, uh, for the Magariba, the North African Mujahideen who came and settled in that area, the madrasas, everything completely destroyed on the first week of the occupation. It was uh, an amazing, incredible, lively neighborhood that was destroyed over uh, one night. In 1969, Al-Aqsa was burnt by a Christian Zionist. The dangers on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is not by Jewish Zionists only, but Christian Zionists are uh, a very dangerous, and if not more dangerous, uh, just as dangerous on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa as uh, Jewish Zionists. The tunnels underneath Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa were exposed by Sheikh Ra'al Salah. The digging that is taking place underneath Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa have continued and have not stopped. The massacres that have taken place, uh, the first intifada I told you was related to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in 1929. Tomorrow is the anniversary of it. Uh, the second great intifada uh, in 2000 took place because of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa when Ariel Sharon stormed into Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, massacre in 1990. Just in 2017, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa was closed down for two weeks. And according to the deal of the century in Donald Trump, Al-Aqsa should be open to the three religions. So it should be open to Muslims, Christians, and Jews for them to come and pray at the times that they wish to pray uh, according to the religious aspects. You saw what happened just a few days ago on Ashura, the attack on Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, if I would go and tell you what happens there, uh, before we get to the st stage, when we talk about what is happening in more detail, which we will come to and, and do, uh, where Muslims are banned entry into Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa while uh, tourists and Zionists are able to uh, enter Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Uh, if you stand in front of them and if you resist, then you will be attacked uh, by the soldiers. You will be expelled from Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa like Sister Hanad al-Halawani, like Sister Hadid al-Hawais, like many of the Murabitat, like many of the ulama are banned from entering Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And you saw what happened last Ramadan with the attack and the Ramadan before that. As long as Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is under occupation, this ummah has uh, no honor. The honor of this ummah is connected to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and we need to come together towards the liberation of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, but this takes a lot of uh, effort from this Ummah to come together until the day that we are able to liberate Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and to bring it back uh, under uh, uh, and under uh, Muslim, Muslim rule. Okay, if we head now back to the questions, I don't know if Amr is with us to ask the questions or shall I run through the questions? Uh, where do we start from? I can see a question from Rumesha. Uh, what is the main reason that Israel feels that they deserve to occupy Palestine even though it has belonged to the Muslims from the beginning of time? See, this is uh, the dichotomy that we're talking about. They do not recognize Islam as starting from the start. They see it as Muhammadans. Even the Orientalists talked about uh, Muslims as Muhammadans, followers of Muhammad. Uh, so this is a problem that they see. And they, they claim even secular Zionists, so this is very interesting, secular Zionists like Theodore Herzl or like Ben Gurion see that uh, uh, the, uh, this land was promised to them by God. You do not believe in God. How do you believe that this they used religion to unite the Jews around Jewish nationalism to take this land. But actually, this project started with Christian Zionism, uh, who were pushing this idea uh, forward. Uh, so they believe that this is the land that God promised them. And uh, even secular, non, uh, God non-believing uh, 
uh, Zionists uh, would use the say, this line to argue this. Okay, Dimas uh, has a question. Is there any reason for the unique shape of Beit al-Maqdis of al-Masjid? Is it related to the hadith of the best place in the end of the time uh, where can where one can see al-Masjid al-Aqsa? Very, very interesting hadith. Uh, on the question of the shape of al-Masjid al-Aqsa being exactly like the Kaaba, this is another discussion where uh, uh, some argue that the Kaaba is a split image of the heavenly Kaaba. Uh, so these dimensions are heavenly, divine dimensions, and not uh, human uh, dimensions. That's why each wall has a different, uh, different shape. Uh, is it related to the hadith of the blessed place where one... There is a hadith that uh, Brother Dimas is asking about, which uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, um, uh, when he comes out of his mm, house, he sees the Sahaba discussing a prayer in Al-Aqsa is more valuable or in, 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 in the mosque of the Prophet in Medina. And the Prophet at the end of that hadith, he says, there will come a time where, where from one uh, the hadith is uh, 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 the prophet says in the hadith that there will come a time where uh, a believer from where he can see Bayt al-Maqdis is better than the whole world and what's within it. This takes the virtue of Bayt al-Maqdis beyond anything else and I believe that we are living during that time. Uh, Isra verse okay, how Okay, who's asking the question, Muntaz? How is it that in so many years that there is no liberation movement within Gaza or the West Bank, or is it just not reported? Actually, the people of Gaza and the West Bank are putting their life on the line on your behalf. They are defending Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and what you saw in not last Ramadan, the Ramadan before, the people of Gaza were willing to risk their life and they lost so many people to defend the Masjid Al-Aqsa. The question is, what has the Ummah done? The people in the West Bank are doing everything in their, in their hand to defend the Masjid Al-Aqsa. The people around the Masjid Al-Aqsa are doing everything in their hand to defend the Masjid Al-Aqsa. They're putting their lives on the line. The question is not about what they have not done. It's about uh, what they have done or not done. It's the question, what have we done? We need to ask ourselves this question. This is not a Palestinian issue. They are defending Al-Aqsa on your behalf and on, on my behalf. So ye, we need to, uh, as an ummah, uh, work towards helping them in this, uh, in this issue. Uh, question from Dimas again. Uh, to what direction did Prophet Sallallahu do during the night journey? Let's leave this question when we come back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you are inside, but to give you a, a tip of the answer, when you are inside the Qibla, the Kaaba, you have no direction to pray towards. Al-Aqsa was the Qibla of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he's inside the Qibla, and there was a disagreement amongst the scholars uh, on the particular direction, but we may revisit it at another, uh, at another time. Fatima, she says, is it true that the same will happen to Al-Aqsa to what happened to Masjid Ibrahim in Hebron? Actually, thank you, Fahima. Sorry, not Fatima. Uh, Fahima Miller. Unfortunately, this is the direction we are moving towards. And this last few weeks, this is becoming not just uh, a dream, but it's becoming a reality. And this is moving towards what happened in the Mosque of Ibrahim in Al-Khalid is after uh, a massacre by uh, uh, a Jewish Zionist. He walked in while people were praying in the month of Ramadan, in the Fajr prayer, and he killed in my city, in Al-Khalid, he killed in 1994 uh, tens of Muslims in the middle of Salah, like what happened in New Zealand, if you recall. Uh, but they were in their sujood and he went in with the help of Israel soldiers and gunned them down while they were in their sujood. Uh, after that, Israel sealed off the mosque for six months, then opened the mosque with 60% of the mosque turned into a synagogue. 
Israel is aiming to do the same in the Masjid uh, of Al-Aqsa, uh, in the Masjid of Ibrahim. Uh, tens of times, Adan is not even allowed. Uh, they are being uh, uh, Muslims are not allowed some days in Jewish holidays. Muslims are not allowed into Al Masjid, uh, uh, the Masjid of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam. My apologies. Um, on the phone, uh, and it rang, so it twisted my uh, picture. My apologies for that. Uh, so they are planning to do that uh, and unfortunately they have uh, gone as far as 60% of achieving the spatial and uh, okay. temporal division of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa uh, Al-Mubar. Uh, uh, so this is something that unfortunately uh, continues uh, to happen in uh, in 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 Beit al -Maqdis. Okay, uh, thank you for that. We'll go to the next question. Uh, next question: Do they want to destroy Masjid Al-Aqsa to complete this ritual? Uh, unfortunately, Athara's uh, question: uh, This is the long-term goal. The long-term goal is to reach uh, and build a Jewish temple over the site of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. And this is something that is uh, very, uh, very worrying. I'm trying to run through the questions as fast as I can. When the horse and the sword was taken away along with the spoils of war from man, they were reduced. I didn't understand the question. If you, Javid, ask the question again. Salah al-Din Ayyubi, he said he didn't liberate the Holy Land with the sword, he liberated it with knowledge. Yes, that is true. That's the words of Salah al-Din. On the day he liberated the Masjid al-Aqsa, he said, do not think I liberated these lands with your swords. I liberated them with the knowledge or the pen of al-Qadi al-Fadi. Uh, Mumtaz, they have support of the Ummah, uh, not just the sword. I might not be seeing the questions. Okay, how did all who say we are Muslim come to submit to false governments in the world? It is sad but difficult that the minority, unfortunately, this ummah needs to wake up and get out of this, uh, uh, this uh, current uh, status where we have been, uh, we will come to this also in the last class, how Muslims have been uh, preoccupied with ideas of um, nationalism and each one fighting for uh, a new homeland that he uh, has been created for them. Muslims have lost the concept. Yes, Christian Zionists are very, uh, very uh, dangerous. Question from Shima. I will, uh, do, did you say Masjid al-Aqsa was the first Qibla? But the Kaaba was built 30, for 40 years earlier. I said the okay, there are two concepts we discussed. At the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Kaaba was the first qibla of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the first building on earth is the uh, Kaaba. So do not confuse the uh, two uh, together. We might come back to this. At another, uh, at another uh, uh, time. Amina says, a while ago, I was told not to attend the protest for Palestine because apparently in the Quran it says that it will never be liberated. That's nonsense. Actually, the Quran in verse 7 uh, of Surah Al-Isra talks about exactly the opposite. It says that this land will be, and the hadith of the Prophet this land will become the center of the future Khilafah. The last Khilafah will be centered in Bayt al-Maqdis uh, in the hadith of Rasulullah So definitely it's going to be liberated. Verse 7 of Surah Al-Isra says that the masjid will be entered after the children of Israel's faces will be disgraced. Uh, so the, the, the Quran uh, uh, doesn't say that uh, uh, it will never be uh, liberated. Um, who invented uh, Solomon's temple? 
actually the concept of the first temple is uh, was developed uh, in Babylon while uh, Bani Israel, the Jews, were in exile uh, after Suleiman Islam, and they developed this based on Babylonian temples. Uh, temples, and you see this in the Old uh, uh, Testament that what is being pictured doesn't fit in Masjid Al-Aqsa, by the way, and also does not fit uh, the uh, places of worship in that area. It fits more with uh, something, uh, uh, something else. If the if the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a mean of dignity, okay. I think just comments. The question is that if the Kaaba was the first building, do we know why the first Qibla was towards the Masjid Al-Aqsa? Um, this, uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, we can leave this to the third class where I will come back and visit this again. Uh, and at that time, I will give you uh, some more uh, context and some more detail uh, into this issue. Fahmi is asking if is it science still digging underneath the Masjid al-Aqsa to find until okay since 1967 they've been digging underneath the Masjid al-Aqsa and they have found nothing whatsoever underneath the Masjid al-Aqsa relating to anything Jewish everything they are finding is Islamic they went down to the core and they have not found anything uh, they are still digging the diggings haven't stopped. The other aim of the digging is to weaken the foundations of the Masjid al-Aqsa. So this is something very dangerous uh, that is expected. Uh, is there any reason why Mamluks and Ottomans prefer to use the term Al-Quds al-Sharif? No, no, they used the Masjid al-Aqsa. Actually, they used Al-Haram al-Sharif. The reason why they used Al-Haram al-Sharif is uh, because Al-Aqsa then got narrowed down to that other building. So when Al-Aqsa was narrowed down to that other building, Al uh, Haram al Sharif was being used for the whole compound. Uh, so that was uh, uh, that was the, uh, the, the 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 problem uh, uh, there. Okay, uh, I'm trying to run through the questions. I cannot find any more uh, answers. Explain what Azawiya is again. Uh, Azawiya is a place where uh, Sufis used to sit and make dhikr. Uh, this was part of the Muslim tradition. Uh, so, and also it has uh, many other uh, uh, many other uh, uses as a place of uh, uh, many other uh, many other issues. Uh, I. Uh, it's nearly seven o'clock. It's, it's seven o'clock here in Turkey and in Beit al Maqdis. So it's seven o'clock. Can we please leave the rest of the questions till next week? We've been on for exactly two hours. And I would like to thank every single one of you for joining us in this uh, lecture. Next week, we will start with the early history and we will engage with the discussion on that, inshallah. Zawjal. Please do not lose the questions we will come back to them again thank you very much for attending i'm not sure if uh, uh amr or anyone else is still with us uh if not i would uh, conclude here but what we would like to continue with over the next uh, uh over the next uh, few uh, weeks uh is um the history of Beit al -Maqdis. Today we talked about the importance of Beit al -Maqdis. And if I go back here, uh, uh, what we covered today, uh, oh, you're not able to see the screen. Let me put the screen back on. Uh, we've covered today the importance of Al-Aqsa and Beit al -Maqdis to Islam. We talked about the terminologies and the importance of the terminologies relating to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the concept of Bayt Al-Maqdis, the concept of the Holy Land, the concept of the Land of Barakah, please start using these terminologies. The idea of revitalizing, reusing the terminologies that are associated uh, uh, with, with our Aqidah reconnects and re, uh, makes that extra connection and that extra bond with Beit al uh, again. So I hope we will be able to uh, 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 do that, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. 
uh, re revive the usages of the term Baytul Maqdis, Al Ardul Muqaddis, the Holy Land, and the Land of Baraka, and uh, uh, try to engage with the uh, these terminologies. We understood that Al Aqsa is the first Qibla, the second mosque on earth, and one of the three holy places every Muslim should set out to visit. Uh, finally, next week we'll get uh, through the ancient history of Beit al-Maqdis in Palestine, early connections with Beit al-Maqdis the following week, and we will come to the Crusades and to the current period, all within six weeks. So I know it's condensed, but I hope this will be a starting point for continuing for future moves, uh, uh, future endeavors to learn more about Beit al-Maqdis, inshallah. Azzawajal. Thank you very much for being with us. Jazakumullah khair al and hope to see you next Sunday, which will be the uh, 21st of uh, August at 4 p.m. Baytul Maqdis time. Jazakumullah khair al Thank you very much, and salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.